VHS code. You shit with that ass? Hey, you shit with that ass? Hey, you shit with you, that ass? You, 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 you do a dookie with that butt? That's how, I, that's how I pick up the ladies. Hey, you do dookies with that butt? No, you don't. You have a wife. A wife, sir. <laughs> that's how I talk to her. I'm like, hey, hey, wife, you do dookies with that butt? Oh, but you're married for many years, so you are, already know she does dookie with that butt. <laughs> I mean, I just know that all girls do dookies with their butt because... Hey, you sure with that? Hey, guess what? You're human. You do dookie with that butt. Unless you have a colostomy bag, right? Well, then you, there's like... real. I don't want to make that joke. Well, I mean, what if you don't know? And then they're like, no, I don't. No, I don't. And Look at this. Pull up their shirt and they show you this. I feel like you'd probably smell it. They show you this. Have you ever bag. been around with someone with a colostomy bag? No. Because I have. The stank. It's got stank to it. Oh, it's stank. It's real unfortunate. I mean, what can you do? Poop in a bag, apparently. Gotta be alive. I'm Sean. This is the VHS Colt, and that's Kyle, and he smells like butts. I'm Kyle. I don't. It's been a big week for music. Is it? Grimes' new album came out. What's it called? It's called Miss Anthropocene. Um, It's pretty good. I mean, she still got it. That's what I gotta say about it. <laughs> Ali X's album, whatever it is, though, I don't know. <laughs> also came out the same day, and I think I like it more than Grimes' album, though. So that's cool because she's not having Elon Musk's baby. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, Tame and Paula's got a new album. It's all right. I can't listen to their previous album, Currents, because it reminds me of the girlfriend I was dating at the time. It kind of makes me sad, even though I'm like still friends with that girl and stuff. It's just like I don't know. Simpler times. Was times. it though? I don't know. Big, the big, <laughs> big, big thing though is uh, Andrew Weatherall died this week. And for those not familiar, he is a uh, British DJ. Really did a lot for like um, the house scene in the '90s. Basically, just one of the luminaries of the DJ dance scene. And um, he wasn't like a little bitch about the music either, too. Where he's just making the most like soulless corporate EDM that you're familiar with now. This is back when there was like still a punk rock element to the dance music. And he just continued to do it for the entire of his life. He'd just do DJ sets where he'd roll up and just play dub records for like two hours and be like, fucking deal with it, kids. But uh, he died from a pulmonary embolism or something like that, I think. So the old sucks. PE. Yeah. Just a little quote about him. In the 30 odd years that dance music culture has been happening around. Uh, his work, dance music, has become homogenized commer- and commercial, but Weatherall was considered a hero because he would completely ignore what was in vogue and would never do it to make a name for himself. There used to be something immortal about him that he encapsulated something really magical about what it was like to be in London at a time when cultures were exploding into each other. So, rest in peace, Andrew Weatherall. Um, I'm not a big fan of dance music as it exists today, but I was into dance music uh, the earlier, like, early dubstep and shit like that that was coming out in England back when I was very young, before it became... I was into it before it was cool. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a... Honestly, there's a um, a big argument to be made about a lot of genres of music where as soon as it does become commodified and just turned into a commercial endeavor, where it, it just becomes bad. Like, I know, obviously, it's uh, with all the hipster cliche, like, oh, I liked it before it was cool. So I liked it before it was cool. I liked it before it got bad because it became commoditized. <laughs> and yeah, so let's deal with that. Rest in peace to that fella. He um, continued making music until he died. You can check out some of his like crazy remixes on YouTube. I think that's a good place to start. And then I think they have like full DJ sets up on YouTube and shit. Last week, though, we watched, um, you know, um, Serpent in the Rainbow. Mm-hmm. And we mentioned Papa Shango, and you were like, I think there was like a lot of voodoo stuff going on at the time. I couldn't re- really recall anything. But I do remember there was like a voodoo subplot in one of the Weekend at Bernie's movies, like maybe the <laughs> second one. <laughs> it seems like that should be a big plot, a week, part of Weekend at Bernie's, but yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, I just, I don't, um, I didn't like any research into it. I just remember that at one point they, to me. they were just going to, they were going to try to bring Bernie back to life using voodoo, I think. So there's an example. 
and I couldn't think of anything else. But uh, I guess I could have done research and in, 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 into it afterwards. But in, after uh, after we're done with the podcast, I never wanted to think about Serpent in the Rainbow again. I did, however, find a review, a five star review that we'll read later. No, you read right now. What? Let's get it out. Let's get going. You want to get these both out of the way? I'll, I'll, we, we also mentioned last week. Um, I bet I could, about finding a movie that we thought was good or we liked. And someone's the, negative the one, one, of it. one star review. Um, I didn't do a lot of research into that, but I'm like, oh, well, I wonder what people said about Blade Runner the director's cut since we both like that. Mm-hmm. And I found a one star review of Blade Runner the director's cut, and I, I can read that for you as well. Well, we'll do that one towards the end. We'll keep the audience um, we'll in suspense. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a little. Hard. It's like uh, it. the nightly news. Yeah, coming up, uh, bad review of Blade Runner. <laughs> Stay tuned after the other content. <laughs> Um, this is from Grigory's girl. Oh, okay. I feel like I should do this in a voice. I'm doing it in a voice. Ready? Yeah. This is my favorite Wes Craven film. A very scary and intelligent film based on a factual account. This is a witch? (laughs) Yeah. I just assume she's like an old, old, crazy woman. Okay. Many of Craven's films, especially his earlier ones, had... Either had bad acting, poor production values, but have all had a creepy, squarey quality to them that is impossible to shake. This film has a very good acting, if you say so. Has a very good acting. <laughs> Incredible atmosphere. It's shot on location in Haiti. It wasn't really that. <laughs> and incredible tension. Craven doesn't go for cheap laughs here. Or any at all. Well, yeah, why would there be, <laughs> why would there be jokes in it? Yeah. He takes this subject very seriously eh, and doesn't make light of it. Mm, okay. There's no self-consciousness or self-referentialness of his later Scream movies. Yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Craven has said the strange phenomena happened during the shooting of this film. You didn't go into this in your... Oh, I didn't hear about any spooky stuff. To was... those in the crew who mock the idea of the native religion. But Craven respected it deeply. And nothing unique happened to him. Oh, did this person make that all up? I, I feel like it. they 100% did. I didn't, didn't hear they? any of that. Yeah. I've always had mixed feelings about Craven, liking this films, liking some others, Last House on the Left, the original Hills Have Eyes, and hating others. Whoa. I was never a fan of Nightmare on Elm Street, and I hate self-referential films like Scream in general. <laughs> this version sucks. <laughs> but Craven didn't write the script. This is one of his best films, and the one I like the most. Wow. That's the review? <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's it. Five stars. Five stars. Okay. Um, it's definitely not one of Wes Craven's best films. <laughs> so, it was a goddamn mess. Let's fuck that up. I also, I really, did they do a lot of research into voodoo and take it seriously? They read the book, that book that that, um, like, that everybody says is kind of a joke. Yeah, I'm sure they read that. Maybe. And then uh, yeah. 100% she made up that thing about nothing, the sh- weird shit happening to the crew and... Yeah, I didn't see anything about that anywhere, so I don't think I that's I feel like true. that would have come up in your researches. Well, they I'm, it would have been part of the big promotional shit at the time, I'm sure. Like, <laughs> oh. oh, it would have come up in all like the Getting interviews. Right? Yeah, like they'd be on David Letterman talking to fucking the president of Earth, Bill Pullman. Like, oh, I heard you got spooked in Haiti. And he'd be like, well, I actually couldn't really film it in Haiti. But the Dominican Republic we got spooked there. No, this lady said it was filmed on location in Haiti. I oh, remember they had to leave because of political strife. Oh. so only. But uh, she said it was, so. Yeah, but she doesn't know what she's talking about. Because she said Scream was bad. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't like self-referential films. Okay, she doesn't like to think, huh? I don't know. The, uh, Scream isn't really... S- I guess it's referencing Wes Craven, but it's not really self-referential. No. It... it I guess technically it's self-referential because it's a slasher movie that's commenting on slasher movies while the slashing is taking place, but it's a meta commentary on the horror genre or the slasher subgenre. And so, um, just like Silent Night, Deadly Night. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think the qu- closest equivalent is um, Cabin in the Woods, which is a really bad version of it, and that's what you get when. 
they for some reason they let the like kissless nerds take over Hollywood. <laughs> You've already won on your uh, Cabin in the Woods rant at least once on this I think podcast. So, yeah, <laughs> it's just the ongoing narrative I have about um, popular film. It's like they let the nerds take over, and it was bad. All these goddamn nerds. Oh well, here's a movie we watched a movie this week that wasn't made by nerds though. Eddie Murphy's a nerd. No, he's a par- he likes to party all the, the time. time. Party, party all the that's time. his girl who likes to party all the time. He, he does. He too. May, may or may not like to party all the time. You know he does. I I just saw uh, on YouTube. I was just the other day. It popped up a video of uh, Eddie Murphy playing like reggae or something. Yeah, with Snoop Lion. Uh huh. <laughs> they pl- they did Red Light. Um, that came up on my YouTube the other day too. I watched it then. I was like, uh, all right. <laughs> Harlem Knights. Um, we'll just start off this review with my favorite interaction of the film. Eddie Murphy goes to see Richard Pryor after he has to kill Calhoun's uh, girlfriend, whatever, and he just answers the door, and Eddie Murphy's like, I killed her. And Richard Pryor goes, Tore the pussy up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Richard Pryor is the best part of this movie. <laughs> uh, I think Red Fox is the best part of this movie. Oh yeah, him. This is- movie reveals that Red Fox and Wes Craven have a very similar understanding of voodoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like Red Fox and Del Reese um, arguing with each other. Oh movie. yeah, that's great. <laughs> but I don't think Red Fox is that great without Del Reese being there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look up voodoo, bitch! Shut up, fat bitch! <laughs> Well, except for the gag with his glasses is is good. Pretty good. When they put he puts them on and he's just looking through them with big old bug eyes. Um, the uh, the sequence with Arsenio Hall. I think I've seen this movie probably a handful of times, but <laughs> never just, does not make me laugh. <laughs> he just cried the whole time. <laughs> you killed my brother. Also, Quentin Tarantino stole the uh, the the junior bit. You shot junior. The. When the from oh Pulp shot, Fiction, you shoot Marvin, Marvin in the face. Shot Marvin in the face. Oh, it was an accident. Oh man, you shot Marvin in the face. Uh, this is during the 1930s. A New York City illegal gambling house owner and his associates with must deal with strong competition, gangsters, and corrupt cops in order to stay in business. Um, it's uh not as not as many jokes as I remember. Yeah, it's, it's more of a. It is kind of a satire. No, not even that. I think it, maybe Eddie Murphy drama. was intended to make it like a legit ass drama. It's got like a real um, Coen Brothers Miller Crossing kind of yeah. vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just not shot as it well. It just falls short. Yeah. Well, that's because this movie is the only movie that has been directed by Eddie Murphy. And by his own admission, Eddie Murphy felt that he didn't dedicate enough thought or care to the directing of his debut. He was more concerned at the time with figuring out where the next party was going to be. Because he likes to party party all the time, time, party party all the time, time, party all the time. time. Uh, Luckily, Richard Pryor's in it, though, and he's uh, funny. He's got got, like this um, calm, like soft, laid back delivery on every line in the movie that I really appreciate where he's just kind of like nonchalant about it. Um, In his autobiography, though called Prior Convictions and Other Life Sentences, which is this pretty good, pretty clever title. Uh, he's, I'm shocked from Richard Pryor. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, stated that he never connected with Eddie Murphy. People talked about how my work had influenced Eddie, and perhaps it did, but I always thought Eddie's comedy was mean. I used to say, Eddie, be a little nice, and that would piss him off. I finished Harlem Nights thinking that Eddie didn't like me. So... I guess the, wah, wah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that was sad. Man. Why did you bring that up? <laughs> this is also um when he had uh, Richard Pryor just gotten the diagnosis for um what do you have MS right? I want to say that's right. Uh, what well, the disease that ended up killing him? This is when he first was diagnosed with it, and he was keeping it a secret still. So he's probably just sad when they're making the movie, anyways. That may also explain why he's so like kind of sad old man in the movie. You know? <laughs> He really did. He's really he's really using it. Yeah, and then we got Red Fox. So that completes the triumvirate of like three generations of black comedians. Red Fox, Richard Pryor, down to Eddie Murphy, and then Kevin Hart. No, Chris Rock. Chris Rock. It's gotta be Chris. Then Rock. Dave Chappelle. Yeah, but they're the same generation. Same generation. Chris Rock. Pick one. Dave Chappelle. <laughs> And there can only be one black comedian at any given time. time. Well, it's Hannibal Burst now. <laughs> Too bad he's a filthy landlord. 
But he's got some good jokes. We also have Del Reese. Del Reese. You know, like, all the memes on the internet where it's like, oh, when the nice black lady at the grocery store calls you baby and it makes you feel good. This Del Reese is kind of like one of the, is kind of the, uh, the epitome. The of, archetype. Yeah. And that's kind of what she plays in the film. And A little all, bit. <laughs> also in Touched by an Angel. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> probably more in Touched by an Angel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think she's badass in this movie. She loves Eddie Murphy, but she's going to fist fight him. She she's going to cut him. Yeah. <laughs> she's shot off my goddamn pinky toe. I like when they say, you come on step cover, I'll shoot off your pinky toe. Shoot off pinky toe. And he looks at back at the boys and they're like, hmm. <laughs> I don't think she was really going to cut him, though. Maybe. But it was also like just a little razor, so they'd probably just give him... You know, a lesson cut. Just a few <laughs> cuts for a lesson. I gotta make that face a little less pretty. Uh, we also got uh, Jasmine Guy, or maybe Yasmin. Yasmin? Yasmin. Um, she plays Bugsy Calhoun's girlfriend who tries to murder Eddie Murphy, but he instead murders her. She's uh, from another world. Yeah, she sure is. I think she also made appearances on like Living Single. Which was friends before friends. <laughs> we had this conversation. Oh, yeah. They stole it from black people again, <laughs> huh? Uh, she is, uh, um, she's like kind of in it, but not really in it. She's, the, the plot or in the pacing of the movie is kind of a mess. Yeah, yeah. So it seems like she's going to be an important character, and then her and Eddie Murphy have sex, and she Eddie does. Murphy kills her. <laughs> but um, she is currently uh, the front runner in 2020. VHS cult night nightgown queen. <laughs> I had a huge crush on her for when she's in another mm-hmm. world. I yeah, that. I did too. Um, yeah, so right now she's she's in the lead. What other competition may arise for the rest of 2020? It would have to be a pretty stiff competition because she is looking good. Good. Uh, I imagine this is you. You're going to bring him up as part of the cast, but I'll, I'm going to pull him up now because he shows up at the same time as uh, it's Bugsy Calhoun's girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Uh, La, what's her name? Larue's her last name. Dominique Larue. Is that her name in the in Hollow Nights? Yeah, that's Yasmin. Yeah, 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 no, no, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay, but yeah. I could, for some yeah. reason, my brain didn't. But uh, Tommy is what I was going to talk about because he plays Tommy and Martin too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, do you ever remember what? Did they ever explain what Tommy did in Martin? What his job was? I know we stopped watching like when all at some point. Wasn't he a mailman or something? No, he always had money, and they don't think they ever he. It was like, like Barney Stinson from How I Met Your Mother always reminded me a lot. Oh, of the Tommy. same thing where you don't like, really yeah, know you don't does. know what he does. Damn, Gina! <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, Why are you accusing uh-huh. me of sexual harassment, Gina? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's right, huh? <laughs> that's when we stopped watching. I yeah, because the that's times scandal about it. the time slots got all funky. Damn, Gina! Martin was a good show though. Martin, Martin, Martin. Mm-hmm. Wasn't there a little Martin puppet in the intro? I remember it, I but remember I haven't spent years puppet. since I've seen the intro. Hmm. My end. I haven't seen Martin since we were kids. I yeah. mean, the TV show. I've obviously seen Martin Lawrence since we were kids. Yeah. He's, he was just in he's, Bad Boys for Life. Life. Did that come out? Yeah, it came out. Shit. It he looked swollen. It didn't do very well? No, it did all right. Oh. I didn't even realize it came out. God damn. Uh, we also got Stan Shaw, who plays uh, Jack Jenkins, the boxer with the speech impediment. <laughs> He's uh, returning to VHS cult after being in Monster Squad, right? He's the dad's partner, the funniest dude in the movie. Not he, as funny in this. No, um, he's got some good lines. <laughs> but um, uh, there's a scene where, uh, what's the name, uh, Canton, the, the detective, the shitty detective who works for Calhoun, is um, bullying the shit out of him. <laughs> and it makes me feel really sad. <laughs> I was like, man, fucking knock his ass out. So they did a good job. That's uh, Danny Aiella. They did a really good job characterizing him as a dickhead. Yeah, he, no, he, he was he pissed me the fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, God damn, this fucking Danny Aiella, you fucking piece of shit, you shut up. <laughs> That's uh, the scene where he first shows up in the nightclub, like where uh, uh, Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy look over and he's just like going, like doing his little dance. Yeah. <laughs> like this fucking piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he fucking sucks. I hate him. <laughs> and then uh, Bugsy Calhoun is played by Michael Lerner. Uh, I guess he's supposed to be an Irish gangster with the name like Calhoun. But he looks like an Italian gangster. Yeah, he looks a little, you know, a little bit of like an, uh, maybe Sicilian because he's got the, the darker features. 
Yeah, but yeah, he's stereotypical, you know, white gangster. They all they're all kind of the same. <laughs> and then of course we got a few cool cameos. Charlie Murphy's in it. And Arsenio's in it. Arsenio's got a much larger cameo. Charlie Murphy's just the newsstand guy that helps him with their scam. What was he? he had a pretty good line though? I don't remember what it was now. I guess it wasn't that good. <laughs> Obviously not if you don't remember it. Rest in peace, Charlie. And then, yeah, Arsenio cries a bunch. <laughs> you can love brother. Oh, my brother. Uh, that scene where um the shootout where, like, Eddie Murphy just I'm, is... I'm sorry. He's just kind of done with it, and he fires wildly and gets yeah, them all. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, when, I, when I watched it this time, I was like, what? What happened? <laughs> yeah, he just gets lucky, I guess. Yeah, Eddie Murphy's character in this movie sucks. I don't really like him. There's not really, there's not really much there's for not, him to he's, do. Well, he's just a really shallow character. He's just like, oh, he's a tough kid, and he was raised by Richard Pryor, and now he's a loose cannon, but he always wins, so no consequence. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing bad ever can happen to him. Um, Eddie Murphy once said that the jokes and camar- camaraderie between him, Richard Pryor, Red Fox, Robin Harris, and Della Reese behind the scenes was much funnier than anything that was in the film. So he did they a bad should have, uh, film that then. He did a bad job directing, <laughs> just like he says. <laughs> In addition to that, the vulgar vulgar yet playful arguments between Red Fox and Del Reese on the set inspired Eddie Murphy to create a series starring the two. The result was the Royal Family, which was Fox's final project before his death. I don't remember that TV show do you? I don't remember it either. I'm gonna watch it though. <laughs> Check it out. And then, yeah, the story of Irish mobster Bugsy Calhoun trying to take over Sugar Ray's nightclub in order to control Black Harlem is loosely inspired by the real-life feud between Jewish gangster Dutch Schultz and Black gangster Bump- Bumpy Johnson over control of Harlem's lucrative numbers gambling <laughs> rackets in the mid-1930s. Dutch Schultz and Bumpy Johnson? <laughs> I don't think Bumpy was his real first name. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, how do you think he got the nickname like that? Do you think he had, like, acting scars or something? I mean, I guess that's the fun. That's probably the, the most obvious one. Mm-hmm. It's not the most fun answer. I, well, I you feel got, like you he's got a like, boxer. He had a lot of herpes. <laughs> <laughs> call him Bumpy Johnson. And Dutch Schultz. Why do they call him Dutch Schultz? Was he, um, he's always going Dutch with his dates. Oh. Or was he a Jewish you know, I have man? These, I have the, these. <laughs> he's a Jewish man from the Oh, Netherlands. wait, no. Wait, damn, that's a racist joke, man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> all Jewish people are cheap, huh? I think he was just a Jewish man from the Netherlands. Or maybe that was Wait, do they name. have Jewish people in the Netherlands? They have Jewish people everywhere. <laughs> They're like, I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere. Persecuted everywhere, Where, man. man. I've been persecuted in the Netherlands. Yeah, that's... You're the, not Syrian. <laughs> like, um, the Ukrainian Jews were excited when the Nazis invaded because they thought... Because the Ukrainians treated, treated them so badly already that they're like, oh, anything will help. Help! <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. What a, what a crazy, fucked up world. This movie's a bit of a cult classic. I love this movie. I remember it being on HBO or some shit when I was a kid and used to watch it quite a bit. But apparently, Eddie Murphy and the movie received two Golden Raspberry Award nominations for Worst Director and Worst Screenplay. Yeah, I mean, it's not that bad. Murphy won for Worst Director. There, there's no way he deserves that. It's not good, but you also, know, it's not um, terrible either. It won Worst Picture at the Hastings Bad Cinema Society's 12th Annual Stinkers Bad Movie Award. These people are just racist. That's 100%. Thinking, like, it's got to be racism. Something like that. Or I was thinking, like, maybe in this time period, was everyone just kind of fed up with Eddie Murphy? Was he, you know, like... I was sick of him. A couple years ago when Adam Sandler, everyone was like, man, I'm so fucking tired of this lazy ass piece of shit making these shitty ass movies. So, and he was, that's all you ever heard about him in the news or anything was, oh, he's got another shitty movie coming out and everyone on the internet complained about it. Is that like maybe the thing, like people are just tired of hearing about Eddie Murphy and the tabloids and whatever he was getting up to. And so he made this, what was perceived to be like a vanity project and like that maybe that was the impetus for it. I, that's giving that's real a, deep I, you so, really got into that well I also don't remember 1989 very well because I was like three <coughs> so I don't know if that's uh, a I reality was, at all it might be that yeah they're just like this fucking all black gangster movie that's stupid because <laughs> <laughs> it's 1989 Hollywood so you know why wouldn't it why wouldn't they feel that way oh I mean sorry Hollywood's always cutting edge <laughs> they're always on the, the, 
They're always on the right side of history. What do you think? Does it still hold up? I mean, I think we kind of went into a little bit. Like, uh, it doesn't quite achieve the promise it sets out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, my problems with it are the tone's a little bit all over the place. Um, it needs to be a little bit more... Tighten up that directing. It needs to be more comedy or more drama. Because as it stands now, it's just kind of like a really bland, dramatic gangster movie with some comedic elements. I feel like it may be if it would have been... I don't know. I, I don't know if I want it to be a full-on spoof, but... I don't... Because, like, again, I feel like Miller Crossing, There's it has a similar tone to Miller's Crossing. I feel mm-hmm. like you, you can tighten up... The tone by changing the way it's shot and directed. Well, yeah, and that um, might fix it. The blindest directing. Ever. And like some of the story needs some work. Like you need to work on Quick's character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, like some of the stuff in the middle doesn't really work for Most you. of the characters are pretty shallow, to be honest. Um, which is fine for some of the secondary characters. But yeah, they really need Eddie Murphy's character needed quite a bit of work. Um, they needed to do something more with. LaRue or make it eat a smaller either make it bigger or make it smaller and then yeah cause her, her position in the story is really weird it just seems to be um a distraction like a temporary distraction and then also at the end my big complaint is um so they just basically defeated their competition and they should be able to just straight up run Harlem now right <clears throat> but they're gonna leave well I think the part of the problem is like the they did uh, fuck with that, with Calhoun, not Calhoun, um, what the hell is the cop's name? He also has a K name, I can't remember now. Cantone? Cantone, thank you, Jesus. They fuck with Cantone, he's a cop, so maybe they don't want the trouble with the police? But you're right, that's the same thing I thought at the end of the Yeah, but they like, just... Everybody's already dead, why don't... Why they don't could just, just buy off the cops like Calhoun did, right? You know what I mean? Obviously the cops... Could you? Do. Yeah? I don't know. It seems like usually gangsters can just buy the police. Calhoun is the own part of the police, why couldn't they just do it? And also, black, Kyle. Yeah, but they're fucking. If they have the money, they run the streets. Like it's gonna. That's change the shit. thing. I'm telling you, that's not how it works. Because <laughs> just because you have enough money doesn't mean that uh, the powers that be are gonna uh, invite you in. You don't think so? No, I can point to uh, examples throughout history. You can look at uh, the actual uh, gangsters in Harlem and see that. I think it's. It's not all uh, an economics. Yeah, I just think it's kind of a weird ending, though. Like it's clear that they're. No, no, no. I mean, we're a far field. But yeah, as far as the ending goes, it is kind of weird. Well, it's like they're on top. And like, yeah, maybe it'll be harder to buy off the police. But if they don't have any competition, they're just going to be able to get more power in the streets. You know what I mean? And like fucking all they have to do is like not call the police about Cantone and let him die in that vault. No one's going to check ever. You know what I mean? So that no, gets just, him out of the way, too. They're checking there on Monday. The bank opened on Monday. Isn't that what no, the bank's been closed for years. They're going to call oh, the police right. on Monday to let him know he's there. If they don't ever call the police, he's gone. Well, the cop disappears. I don't know, man. Like, again, it's it's a weird ending. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. I just It could have been a happier ending. Like, they could have straight up... Here's what makes the end, end happier for me. Straight up murder Cantel and leave him in the vault. Like, like not even tell me they call on Monday. I mean, straight up, like... Shoot the motherfucker in the back of the head. Just leave his corpse in the vault. Done with him. No problem there. Blow up all the competition. Oh shit, we run this shit now. And then the movie just ends with them like all uh, jumping in the air. Freeze frame. The <laughs> <laughs> Hooray. And then the first black president is elected shortly afterwards. <laughs> completely changes the course of history. <laughs> Right? Because thanks to organized crime, um, Kennedy became president. <laughs> they're still hanging Kennedy's picture all over fucking Ireland and shit. So this is how this is how the movie would end for me. I would make like Quentin Tarantino where it's alternate history. Where they just fucking, that's it. We run the streets. Now we're going to install the mayor. And then eventually the governor. And then finally, 20 years later, president of the United States, Jesse Jackson. <laughs> I guess I don't know what Jesse Jackson's uh, ties to organized crime were. I don't know. That I don't was. think he had it. <laughs> <laughs> the Rainbow Coalition, sir. <laughs> that was organized crime. Yeah, so I don't like the ending. I don't like um, the misuse of Yasmin guy. She just kind of doesn't purpose doesn't serve a purpose. Uh, Bugsy Calhoun does not seem like a threat. They kind of try um, to make him seem like a threat. They do some good character work with him in his first introduction. 
Yeah, but then they add every, they just, I don't know, it's, that's what I mean kind of about the tone is like, you don't ever really feel like yeah, anything bad is going to happen. And then like Slick can just accidentally beat Arsenio and his goons and, it, you know, he just seems unstoppable and we have no reason to believe why he is. And he almost got stuck in the beginning of the film. That man was going to kill him. He's like, you know, I don't like throwing dice in front of kids. Kids are bad luck. <laughs> He's right. Mm, that's not bad luck, though. That's consequences. <laughs> <laughs> he he got himself in that situation. <laughs> I like in that scene, though, when um, Richard Pryor thinks he's about to get the gun. He's like, well, I got one thing to say to that. <laughs> And it's not there, and he's like, hmm, slipped my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, also, the the tone that opening scene kind of sets for the, him to be, like, this murderous, like, nine-year-old. You know it's what so I mean? Weird, it's yeah. like, oh, why? that's kind of, like, intense. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, they don't ever explore that. Like, they don't... Uh, you, you, got, see, you got, like, PTSD? They, you know, <laughs> or, like, how you doing, man? <laughs> They kind of set it. I feel like they try to set it up like there's gonna be some father son. Yeah. Uh, let me teach you a lesson about how to get through life, kind of thing. But mm. it doesn't. It, no, it's mostly no it's like you just need to chill out with the murders, man. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I don't give a fuck. I'll murder everybody. <laughs> He's like, No, you can't murder everybody. Someone might murder you. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, you they murder me. I'm gonna murder them right back. Yeah, that's right. Not that I murder them first. That's Calhoun. Calhoun's girlfriend. Fuck that shit. I'm murdering Calhoun. <laughs> Which, I mean, yeah, it makes sense, too. <laughs> He's How could that fucking greasy, cheesy back, 12 sandwich-eating motherfucker <laughs> have a girlfriend like that? It's like, yeah, he's right. Because he's got money. 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 Money and power. Um, so, they also... Let's talk about the uh, scheme they run on Calhoun. And so, it's a bit of like a heist movie thing where, you know, in like Ocean's Eleven where it's like... But here's what really happened, and they show you all the machinations of the squad to like get the heist into place and how it you know turned out. And they do that a little bit in this movie, but it's also done really ineffectively. Where it's just like you don't, there's barely any, there's nothing leading up to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. We don't realize that they have some big grand plan. It's just suddenly there's this B story with uh, Phil and Lady Heroin, right? That we're supposed to care about, but there's. Up to this point, we have no idea she has any association with them. Right. Well, no, they so, they, yeah. they lay it out in like a there's like a couple lines about them. Uh, <laughs> Vera's like we're gonna give we're sending the the best girl after him or pussy yeah. like sunshine, and so there's some indication that that's the the girl, especially when she introduces herself to the dude. She's like, "My name's Sunshine." Yeah. So like, I feel like you you should know. That's but you're still, right. It's that's really loose. Like it the, the whole like, idea, yeah. the whole plot, basically, is that they're gonna trick him into think they're gonna place bets on the uh, the white boxer, mm-hmm. so that he puts his money into the the pot as well, and then they're gonna steal all the money using this li- woman in, in yeah. this plan they have. But then, like the whole firebomb thing, and then killing Calhoun doesn't seem like it's part of the plan at all. It just comes up, seems like it pops up out of nowhere. Yeah, but they must have. Planned it somehow, right? But yeah. uh, I don't know. Like, it's a very loose plan. Yeah, and then they also hired fake cops or hired some actual cops. Yeah, they're either actor cops or cops that they paid. See, they can pay cops <laughs> for <laughs> drug work. Yeah, that's all you use the cops for, anyways. <laughs> from what I've seen, you don't let them. Protection mention. is what you're. Yeah, you're, you're, well, you're basically, you pay them to fuck off. <laughs> There you go. Here's yeah, some well, money that's to, what protection is. Yeah, here's some money to fuck off, you fucking bog apes. Because <laughs> they're all Irish, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are. they like, oh, this is Captain Hogan, and here's Doyle. <laughs> Every single cop is Irish in the movie. <laughs> Which makes sense. It's the time period. Back then, Irish people were cops or gangsters. That was it. I guess maybe today, too. Right? I think most, I'm neither a cop or a gangster. Yeah. I'm just poor. Um... It's still fun, though. It's not a bad movie. I had a good time watching it. It's always good to see, like, Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor. Red Fox got some good gags. Um, Yasmin Guy still looking looking like a babe. And then, um, yo, let's talk about the boxing match. Because then we get into some, a real-life event that also transpired last night after I watched Harlem Nights. Oh, uh, what? Did you box somebody? No. But... 
boxing match, we got um Stan Sh- Stan Shaw who plays uh, Jack Jenkins, who's the he's he's a champ, right? He's a champ. Um, and he also happens to be black, and they have uh some Irish boy, right? His name is like Michael Kilpatrick, I think they say. Kenny or something like that. Yeah. And uh, he's the great white hype, obviously. You see the juxtaposition in the crowd where all the whites stand up and cheer for um, Irish boy. And then all the black people are like, fucking go. Presumably you'd think people would stand up for the champ, though. But it is 1930s. And I was like, oh, luckily times have changed now, right? <laughs> well, guess what happened last night? Last night, there was a fight. A world heavyweight title fight between Tyson Fury and... And Deontay Wilder. Do you know either of these two men? Only vaguely. Uh, Deontay Wilder is... Uh, he was like 41-0. and 0, And it was like 40 knockouts. Uh, he's a black man. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got like a super powerful white hand. And he is the world heavyweight. The WBC, WBC champ. Um, and then he was fighting Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury is... Uh, uh, a British man, but he is from a long line of Irish travelers. Oh, God. He is, in fact, the Gypsy King. So this is a legit thing. Traveler is the best fighter in a generation amongst the traveling community. is usually title of Gypsy King. So Tyson Fury's grandfather was Gypsy King. He had an uncle who's a Gypsy King. Oh, God. Now he's a Gypsy King. Uh, Tyson Fury is a big, fat, white piece of shit, <laughs> but he's really good at boxing. So I don't, I don't know if I want to hate on him too much because he does have like depression and mental problems. Uh, just to give you a breakdown of his uh, like history as a world heavyweight fighter, um, he beat um, Vladimir Klitschko in a technical. He won by points over Klitschko. Klitschko, of course, was like the number one heavyweight fighter for fifteen years. It was the end of his career. Tyson Fury beats him. Everyone's shocked. Because Tyson Fury is like, I'm going to beat that motherfucker. Everyone's like, yeah, right. You can't beat Klitschko. <laughs> he does it. But after he does it, um, he slips into like crazy depression, balloons up to like 400 pounds, or as he would say, 28 stone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's, he's on the verge of suicide. He comes out saying crazy shit about um, crazy racist shit. Pro so Brexit. here's my thing about like, you can be, there's depressed people out there that don't, uh, they don't manifest in like crazy racist shit. You're gonna if you say crazy racist shit when you're depressed, you're gonna say crazy racist shit when you're not depressed. Well, here's the thing: is he's um a fucking traveler, which they're not usually the classiest of people. <laughs> That's uh, racist, Kyle, because tra- Irish travelers are apparently a different race. They are not. There's uh, know, some they're, signs they're of dirt ge- Irish. Some signs of genetic drift, and I'm not saying all travelers are bad people, but their culture is really regressive, and they're all, of course, really like. Old school, staunchly Catholic, which is super uptight and regressive. I'm saying that as an Irish American um, who is comes from a family of Irish Catholics. Yeah, our father went to Catholic school. Yeah, like, yeah, it's <laughs> shit, it's tr- trash culture. Um, I'm not saying all travelers are bad or anything like that, but they have a reputation and he kind of fits that reputation, all right? So that's to say about that. He's also he hates gay people and trans people and blah blah. blah. He's a Catholic piece of shit. Um, but people still fucking love him for some reason because you know why? He's white, Kyle. Because he's the great white fucking hype. You know what? The guy from the actual uh, Damon Wayans movie, the great white hype. He was he was actually he was quite nice. He wasn't racist at all. <laughs> Ethan <laughs> Hawke. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the character's name. It wasn't Ethan Hawke either, was no, it? No, I don't think it was. It was just the guy that looks like Ethan Hawke. <laughs> um, <coughs> but anyhow, so um, they, him and uh, Deontay Wilder had a fight previously that um, came to a draw in points. And Tyson Fury said, fuck that. I'm not going to let the judges decide this one. I'm going to knock this man out. Uh, there was a big fight last night. And remember how I mentioned that I was like, uh, I'm glad times have changed. You know, people aren't going to be that super openly racist about I was boxing. Right? Skeptical of that before the story, <laughs> the story started, and I'm not <laughs> not changing my mind. Well, I have. Um, I'm not going to pay seventy dollars to watch one fight. Is it's, it only seventy? 
It was like 80 or something. I feel like the last time I went to even thought, I even thought about trying to pay for a pay-per-view boxing match was like 100 bucks. Oh, no, it's UFC fights are usually um, more than boxing. But um, as much as I love boxing, especially heavyweight boxing. <laughs> you look at them big boys slapping at each yeah. other, big bodies. Well, I mean, everyone, big sweaty boys. Everyone loves heavyweight boxing, you know what I mean? But um, I'm not going to pay $80 for one fight because undercard fucking sucked. So obviously, I watched an illegal stream because I'm a criminal too. Um, oh, there we go. One of the side effects of watching streams, though, is they always have a fucking stream chat that's running along with it. Obviously, when the fight started, full screen that shit. I don't care. I'm not trying to watch the chat. I'm trying to watch the fight. But, like, leading up to it and afterwards, I was watching the chat a little bit. And fucking, man, mother people, motherfucking people are fucking racist as shit. Saying the worst horrible, horrible shit. Apparently, there's, um, I was, like, somewhat familiar with this pejorative. I'm not gonna like repeat it anything i'll maybe say it once just so people are aware of it but i guess this is like the new preferred like racial slur for uh black people on the internet presumably it's like um crypto fascists or white supremacists you know those type of internet fucking goons that are using it because i think it's been associated with like them and like white supremacist prison members is usually the only other time i've heard it before so i'm assuming <laughs> Those people that are all wrapped up in white nationalism and popularized it. Um, and then the argument, there's people arguing back, obviously, in the chat. But so uh, Deontay Wilder came out um, uh, with, uh, I forget the name of the rapper, but he's rapping a song that's like, it's black excellence, black magic, blah, blah. And then he had historical black figures because it's Black History Month, right? And he came out in like Wakanda armor and shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're like, well, he came out to all that fucking black supremacist, black power shit, so that's what he gets. And it's like, oh my god, what an argument. And to uh, juxtapose that, fucking Gypsy King came out on a fucking throne that he was carried out on, except for his, like, like, uh, fucking cheap and terrible, because fucking, (laughs) he's a a fucking goddamn traveler. (laughs) But, uh... (laughs) Uh, I mean, just first of all, I didn't realize that uh, boxing interests had turned into the WWE at this point. <laughs> but it was, it was that was, like first off, that was like pretty dope. I was like, all right, this is fun. <laughs> um, uh, but to wrap it up, uh, Tyson Fury uh, did he beat the brakes off of Deontay Wilder? Unfortunately, he came to the fight. Fucking, he's six nine and he weighed like two seventy six or something like that. He's a big motherfucker. He looks out of shape as shit, right? He looks like he's just drinking pints, like drinking cans and fucking eating snacks all the time, right? But now nah, he fucking beat the brakes off him. So you might say, uh, well, this is just, you know, people say crazy shit on the internet, especially the anonymity of some random stream chat. Yeah, I right? used to say that 20 years ago, um, but I've met these people in real life now. And so. Yeah, and the thing was, I. Um, relative, the like, mainstream boxing press isn't really talking about any of the negative shit that Tyson Fury said previously because they've all kind of given him the past, like. Oh, he was on, you know, on the verge of killing himself. He was overweight. He was depressed. And, you know, he just said crazy shit. And he's apologized for him. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I fucking know he's just one of those scummy, like, scummy lads. You know what I mean? <laughs> he's a real fucking lad. I know he believes that shit still. And he's just fucking trying to get money. <laughs> you know? He's trying to <laughs> so the mainstream press is, like, fucking totally avoiding it. Which is, I guess, that, that would Bar be... Bar the course, yeah. Yeah, that would be the systematic racism you're used to. And then uh, going even to like Reddit and stuff, like the after the, like the thread after the fight and stuff. There's people that were trying to be casually racist about it and blah blah. blah. And so th- it's like fucking fuck this great white hype shit. Like fucking white people don't need to win at boxing anymore. <laughs> I'm <laughs> pissed at Tyson for everyone because it's encouraging all these people to be stupid as shit on the internet. <laughs> So that's my argument. Um, it was just an interesting series of events because, like, watching Harlem Nights. And then I was like, oh, I guess I'll watch that Tyson Fury in the heavyweight fight. And then um, just like, ah, nothing changes, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Nothing, uh, nothing really changes. 
like uh, uh, was it this debate or the last debate where Amy Klobuchar is like, you know what would be a great way to cure uh, sexism in this country? If electing a woman a president. Because that worked really great for racism. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Speaking of which, Eddie Murphy was accused of sexual assault on the set of Harlem Nights. (laughs) Fuck. (laughs) Yeah. um, It was thrown out of court, though. So... Like maybe the uh, that doesn't mean anything, Kyle. Yeah. Well, I mean the other. I guess the big thing uh, is there a pattern. Has he been accused more than once? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, unfortunately. But he did hang out with uh, Landis, John Landis. Yeah, has he been accused? Of, uh, Wasn't he sexual? Was it his son? I think it was his son. That, Damn it! I mean, but John Landis obviously is a careless, heartless person too. Remember. <coughs> of course, he killed. He got some. <laughs> he got some people killed. People killed on the Twilight Zone movie, and he apologizes about it, whatever. But his apology was really self centered. Like, I don't know if my career will ever recover from it. Not like, <laughs> I'm sorry, these people died. Yeah, so like, he's a piece of shit. Anyhow, even without being a sex offender, he's just kind of a dickhead. I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is, uh, fucking. Tumblr turned everyone into fucking babies for a few years. <laughs> I've never been on Tumblr. Yeah. Is that still a thing? Wasn't there a problem? Like, they got rid of the porn for a while, and then it was well, about it to got disappear. Well, sold then... to, like, Verizon, and Verizon kind of fucked it up, and I don't know if people really use it so much anymore. Nothing wrong with introducing people to new um, ideas about society and how society can operate and how we should treat each other and stuff like that. I just feel like there's uh, this simplicity that people have on the internet that doesn't reflect um, the nature of reality. Like, a lot of the... Well, everybody... In general, people just like to try to be reductive and dumb everything down and strip any sense of nuance out of everything. And the internet has turned that dial up to, like, 15. Yeah, a good example of it is, like, the concept of emotional labor... Like, how it was originally designed to be used. Like, how your job exploits you emotionally, you know, to benefit them. Yeah. And then people are like, yes, that my, that's like relationships with my significant other have a lot of emotional labor and it's bad and blah, blah, blah. And no, fucking... You, you like, fucking no. <laughs> that's not what it is, you fucking dummies. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know what I'm angry about. I don't care. I guess just fucking just do whatever. It's just everyone on the internet seems like they don't spend any time with people in real life. No, well, there wouldn't be time for the internet. If- yeah, they just seem like they're really on the internet. It's like, damn, you really just fucking don't go outside and interact with other people, huh? Fucking weird. <laughs> weird, 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 weird shit. Fucking, no one's probably ever going to listen to this anyways. Unless we'll get, we'll get popular in like a couple years, we'll go back and listen to the backlogs. And they'll be like, oh man, fucking, we got to cancel Kyle. He said some crazy shit. You just cut it out and then I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Whatever, um, fucking Tyson Fury boxing match. Uh, third round, he hit uh, Deontay Wilder hard as fuck in the side of the head and looked like he ruptured his eardrum because his blood was coming out of his ear. Oh, that's never a good sign. And then he, yeah, his balance was all fucked up after that, and it was pretty much over, but it made it to the seventh round. His, oh, my Deont- God. Deontay's corner had to throw in the towel. So, I mean, he yeah, the better fighter won. I just wish it wasn't at the cost of, like, fucking weirdo fat boys on the internet being able to... Somehow use it as ammunition in culture war. In a that, fucking fake race war. Yeah, fucking weird. <laughs> Leading up to the fight, though, um, everyone was clowning on Tyson Fury for being out of shape. Like, in the chat, they are like, fat boy, fat boy, chubby boy, chubby boy. I and mean, just because like, you're fat doesn't mean you can't punch a man in the face. Well, I was, like, fucking, obviously, it doesn't matter. He's got power coming from somewhere, right? And then on top of that, it's like, man, you fucking weirdo sitting here watching a legal stream of boxing match like myself. <laughs> and at least some of half of you are fat boys. Like I know, I know statistics. Most of the people watching it, it's not like they're. Yeah, I know, right? It's shit. America too. Yeah. So what the fuck. Like, at yeah, least eighty percent right. of you are overweight. Yeah. It's like, psh, yeah, right. You fucking fools. You never been. You probably like never even thrown a punch. You don't work out. You don't know shit. 
Obviously, he didn't know shit. <laughs> <laughs> Big motherfucker didn't care. He's just like, whatever, I'm going to be fat and white. And That's, uh, that was Butterbean's uh, career. You ever heard that Butterbean, a lot of his knockouts might have been staged? Oh, really? Yeah. Even the one against Johnny Knoxville? Well, no, probably not. I'm sure he <laughs> punched that dude out. Johnny Knoxville didn't look like he had a chin on him, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, yeah, supposedly, like, his record is mm, inflated. There might have been some stage fights. Some of his, like, early and, like, middle knockouts might have I don't been I'm not a, I don't pay enough attention to uh, boxing at all. So. Uh, that's, he not, like also never really had... Like a real career. Real yeah. fights, yeah. Not against other boxers. I don't know. This is a pretty rambly one. Harlem Knight's still a good movie. Um, Tyson Fury, still a piece of shit. I don't care if he lost weight and stopped drinking or whatever. He said some crazy shit. <laughs> I know he believes it. Because he's a fucking weird-ass Catholic. As soon as he won, he's like, I gotta think the the number one of the Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Oh, I see, Christ. I see. <laughs> yeah. So, fuck that shit. Fuck boxing. Are you boxing ready for film. my uh, one-star Blade Runner di- director? Yeah, now let's hear some other idiot on the internet <laughs> talk about how they hated a classic film. <clears throat> so, this is specifically the director's cut, and you'll, you'll see why when we get into it. Um, and just as a heads up, there's a PS section. I'm not going to go into it because it just goes into the five versus six replicants and what happened to the one replicant. Where is he? It's still out there somewhere. Um, but oh, I'll hold okay. the, the meat of the <laughs> review. <laughs> This is from uh, G. Lindsay, Blade Runner's director's cut, um, one star. The original theater version of this sci-fi masterpiece is, without a doubt, one of the best in the genre. The director's cut is only a tribute to the understandable ego of Ridley Scott. A novice viewer of the latter can only wonder what the heck is going on. I agree with the comments of another reviewer that the death scene of Rutger Hauer is irreparably damaged by the missing voiceover. The drama definitely needs the aspect of humanity provided by Harrison Ford's narration. It is far too dark and brooding otherwise. What? His narrating <laughs> words in the ending scene with Ford driving to safety provide emotional closure. No one knows how much they, time they have, so enjoy every moment. I felt so strongly about all this, I went out and bought a used copy of this movie for 80 bucks on eBay. The end. <laughs> They hate the uh, the director's cut. They uh, prefer the narration, and the original happy ending is the the better ending. They just fucking suck at movies. Well, they just want to have the well. They just like studio shit, you know. They like the the formula. They like what they're used to, and they're like, I one time I tried to try something that I wasn't used to. I didn't like it, so now I only like what I'm used to. <laughs> <laughs> One time I had Indian food, and now I only eat at McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, that was a terrible review. Um, but they spent 80 bucks on the shitty version of the movie. A VHS copy is what it sounds like. Too. Yeah. I love the narration. I like where he narrates what's happening on screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll help. Yeah. Uh, now I got into a car and we drove. Uh, and this guy was driving me, and uh, we we're going to the crime scene to do questions and detectives, do detectives. Yeah, that's that's real shit, I guess. I mean, <laughs> someone out there for everybody. <laughs> you know, the world's a rich tapestry, and some people like the theatrical cut of Blade Runner. <laughs> Not me though. It's it's bad. The movie's like it's like a hundred times better. It's like all the like good pieces are still in the theatrical cut, and but it is wrapped up in this like shitty little package. Like I don't know if I would ever if I would be a fan of the Blade Runner film without like the myriad of director's cuts. <laughs> if, like if it was only just the theatrical version, and it still gained a cult following, which it would have anyways, you know, because it still did. And someone like tried to show it to me around the time I end up watching Blade Runner, I would have been like, uh, uh. This is some pretty 80s cheese, right? <laughs> yeah, she told me he was a special replicant. She <laughs> would never die. <laughs> Hooray! Now they insert some sh- uh, shots from The Shining and it's happily ever after. <laughs> and that's what we call movie magic. Uh, what do you think we're watching next week, sucker? No, I think we already watched that one. Sucker? 
watching them. This will be the first appearance on the VHS cult of one Mr. Chuck Norris. Oh, no. We're going to watch Lone Wolf McQuaid. No, Lone Wolf McQuaid. Yep. He's got a gun and he shoots it and action happens. (laughs) And he is... Mm, mm, Chuck Norris. Mm, I don't talk a lot because I'm wooden and hollow. <laughs> he can't act. <laughs> also, he's just hollow in general. He's a hollow person. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to fill it with God, but and it just, karate, but it didn't work. <laughs> it just made me a fucking asshole. Walker told me I have AIDS. <laughs> Walker told me I have AIDS. <laughs> he's always in his dungarees, <laughs> doing kicks, kicks in your dungarees. Uh, sorry for how tangential this episode was. This I'm is, not. Fuck you. Yeah, this is my podcast. I don't give a fuck. I talk about what I want to talk about. Tyson Fury, you piece of shit. <laughs> you dumb piece of shit. Congratulations on your win, you piece of shit. He's always going to try to box you. No, I'll just try to make him depressed again. You get up to 28 stone. <laughs> You're having heart attacks and shit. I don't think I can box him. He's a lot bigger than me. That's he's, pretty big. 6'9 has definitely got some reach on you. Uh-huh. Also, um, I mean, there's a lot of boxers that could beat me in a boxing match. <laughs> Plenty of them, folks. Um, yeah, it was a good fight, though. It was, like, scary to see blood coming out of his ear. Because it's like, man, I hope it's just a ruptured eardrum. I hope his brain's ain't shaking around <laughs> in there. Yeah, well, he, he was, that was it. Like, I can't believe they let it go to the seventh round, to be honest. Oh, yeah, honestly, I don't know. If have, I was a corner man. Yeah. I might have thrown it in there. He, like, I mean, he must have been... He was coherent enough to, like, want to keep fighting, I think. But, like, But, he, yeah, if your equilibrium was fucked up, it seems like it's real hard to fight. Yeah, he point. didn't, like, have any legs after that. And he was just... Just mostly just trying not... He was just trying to survive. Uh, Lone Wolf McQuaid! VHS Colt! Go to VHSCult.com. Donate Check. to the Patreon. Check us out on Twitter. Twitter. Give us that that chunk, that funk, the funky stuff. I don't even need that much money. It'd just be nice to help out the family. Do something nice for my mama. You know? You know what I'm saying? Nope. Fuck. No, no, the only people listening to podcasts are fucking bourgeois middle class people, anyways. <laughs> Give us your money, you fucking bougie fucks. <laughs> we seem like they're kind of people. It seems like they're podcasts. I don't think so. I'm sure they'd be scared of me because I um, sold drugs a few times and also had to go to prison for a couple days. <laughs> Some of them have bought drugs. I've seen the statistics. Yeah, but they don't fucking like their drug dealers, do they? <laughs> no one likes their drug dealers. <laughs> sure, you do. I know tons of them. They're fine. Cool guys, cool guys. One time, a guy came out. <laughs> I was just stopping by, and he came out. He just was, uh, didn't have a shirt on. He's a big fat guy, and he's falling in the yard because he's so fucked up. <laughs> one time, uh, he wasn't like really my drug dealer, just someone I kind of knew. It was back when I was pretty young. Um, he had like uh, fucking liquid um, ketamine, I think it, it was, and like he had like take you like ingested quite a bit of it and he like called me and my friend at the time and like needed help and we found him just like wandering in the middle of like the streets that fucking wasn't even that late at night it was like 7 o'clock at night (laughs) 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 I'm like hey the sun's not even down all the way Uh, (laughs) yeah he's just barefoot no shirt Talking crazy shit, wandering in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we got him back to his apartment. He's like, yeah, I drank this. And it was just like a mason jar full of like <laughs> some liquid. And I was like, man, man, fuck, people fucking dumb. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's ketamine. I don't remember specifically that. It was a while ago. But yeah, um, <laughs> fucking go to vhscult.com. Join the cult. A fucking, you can lead an interesting life like me if you join the cult. Be friends with the drug dealers. <laughs> Commit crimes. <laughs> I'm not even, not even just pirating um, copyrighted media crimes. I'll teach you how to commit real crimes. We'll steal bikes and file off the serial number. <laughs> <laughs> Capital offense. <laughs> Alright, VHS cult. I'm fucking man. This, this podcast makes me seem fucking crazy. <laughs> I like that you think it's a podcast. <laughs>